Um, next, we would like to open for Q&A session to the floor. Um, yeah, can we have like uh, three questions first? Uh, those who want to ask questions, please queue behind the microphone at the center of the hall, please. Hi, my name is Hafiz Barom. Uh, you would. Um, I have a few comments and one question. Uh, I'll start with a question with, for Professor Weiss. Is it true that uh, even with a ah, thank you, uh, even with a liberal liberalized civil society, violence tends to happen as well. There's no actual correlation. Maybe the level of violence is different. For example, if we look at the bastion of liberals, USA, the NAACP was bombed quite recently during the Charlie Hebdo issue. Um, and I found it ironic that we are talking about multi-ethnicity when um, there's not a lot of multi-ethnicity on the panel, especially since all... Th Thank you, Professor Weiss. But all three of them represent Islam. Not, there's not exactly anyone else there. Um, the other comment that I have is when, you, when Zainab mentioned that maybe the media is being biased towards one side, both sides are playing that. The online media is being biased towards your words, while the mainstream media is biased towards the other. The, the, how do I say this? The responsibility then falls on the people to read both sides. For example, when you were vilifying Isma, I would say that a lot of people vilify Isma, but at the same time, not everyone opens their web portal to see what was the proper statement before it was spun by the media. So that's one commentary. And yes, we have to allow all of them equal space and give them equal credit. Isma may not have the support of every single Muslim Malay out there. I myself testify to that. Um, but at the same time, we have to give them credit. For example, during the floods, some of, some of us here decided to take Tetian Yan's uh, column in Malaysian Insider saying, where were they when the floods happened? Whereas they didn't do their research first. Isma was on the ground. They sent medics into Kelantan and Pahang and even Trengganu. So where were you? Why didn't you research first? This is the fallacy of Malaysians right now. They listen to one side of the argument. They don't look at both sides of the argument. Civil society in that sense, and I hope Professor Weiss can back this up, requires its citizens to actually be learned and educated and seek out all sources of information before making an opinion. The problem with civil society nowadays is we are so fractured politically that we listen to one side, we don't listen to the other. So how do... So to the panel, another question. How do you, all three of you, work towards actually balancing out those comments? Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna... My name is Hasbi. Um, I'm going to start off by trying to ignore everything that was said in the last two hours. <laughs> and uh, the thing that interested me to come here today was actually the last sentence in the spiel for the event, which was, are we living through an ap uh, apocalyptic terminal phase of civilization? And I will start like a Quentin Tarantino movie by beginning at the end. The problems of the world are not political in nature, nor will political parties solve those problems. The problem is fair and equitable allocation and distribution of resources. And politicians are ill-equipped to handle this or even wrap their heads around it. Now, the basis of our current civilization is arguably uh, John Locke's treaties of government, which was the beginning of the spiel for this event. Uh, his three provisos, I'm speaking specifically on the right for private property, uh, there must be enough to, left over for others, no spoilage, and uh, you must uh, um, mix your labor with it. Therefore, you are entitled to the product. That's the basis of current civilization. Then Adam Smith came along and said, private property is a given. Investors can buy any amount of labor. There's no limit to the amount of labor they can buy of other men's work, and there are no limits to accumulation or inequality by extension. 
Now, money buys labor. There's no consideration whether there is enough left over for others. There's no consideration if it spoils because money is like gold or silver and gold and silver doesn't spoil, which is, I will exercise my freedom of expression, bovine manure. Right, now the immediate consequences of this was the rape of the natives that were colonized by the British, the expansion of the slave trade because Africans were not considered part of the human family, they were considered livestock. And, and we're doing the same thing to the Arab right now. Physical slavery has transformed into economic slavery because economic slavery, oh, sorry, uh, physical slavery requires the housing and the feeding of the slaves. Economic slavery requires the slaves to feed and house themselves. Now, coming back to my conclusion, like Quentin Tarantino does, <laughs> there doesn't need to be a global conspiracy of Knights Templar, New World Order, or any kind of that. The conspiracy is out in the open. They meet at the G8 meetings, G20, it's a big, big boys club, and as, <coughs> sorry, as long as we operate on this maxim, I like to use maximum profit, minimum cost, regardless of the environmental and human costs and societal costs, this is where we're heading to oblivion. So politics will never solve it. So my question to the question of are we? I'm asking you guys to question it, not just the panel, but everyone else is to question the question. Are we living through an up, up, uh, I won't pronounce it because I can't, a uh, terminal pace of civilization? Are we really heading in the right direction? Do we really want to go this way? Because everyone here has a smartphone or an electronic device. There's a five-year-old boy in the Congo who has to dig with his bare hands to search for rare earth. A lot of us don't see that line of causality because they are value-added services between us and them. Uh, and comments for the panel. Uh, if I may use one, one Zana. I actually, um, I actually agree with you. There are parallels, uh, but I see it on a larger picture. Like Malaysia, uh, if anyone's familiar, Naomi Wolf, she uh, wrote a book called. Uh, actually, she had a, I watched the documentary. I'm too lazy to write, uh, read the book. But anyway, the documentary was 10 Steps to Close an Open Society. So she, she spoke about the 10 steps dictators take to close an open society. Basically, subverting the rule of law, um, secret prisons, why we decided we would know what secret prisons. Secret prisons doesn't necessarily mean we don't know where they are. They're not accountable. Detention, with, uh, detention without trial is not accountable. And you see, I see those things happening in Malaysia as well. All those 10 steps. She basically compared um, World War II era Germany and uh, Italy with Bush Jr. era America. And for Waibi Sari, yes, I do agree that your assert, uh, assertion that we still think government is power. Some of us, the majority of us do think that. I never signed an agreement over to the government to say that you have absolute control over me. But it's an inherited because of what John Locke started hundreds of years ago. Now, my idea of a government is basically facilitators of the people's decision making and administrators of those decisions, not imposing those, their ideas and not being restricted to a certain class of people. I myself, I'm not middle class. I'm in the bottom 20%. I never went to university, but I was very lucky because I had a father who um, who was a lecturer in English. So that opened up a wider avenue for me. And I've worked with Cynthia before, and Gerald and other NGOs. And I've had moments of radicalization in my life where I've seen the other side of the coin. So I consider myself lucky, but not all Malaysians are like that. And even here, this is a very small, narrow, not so diverse group, even amongst the panelists. Not a criticism. It's not a criticism. It's an observation. And even amongst the audience, it's basically an English-speaking, well, relatively well-educated group. So thank you very much for your time, and thank you for the IRF for organizing this. And then you see nothing come. Yeah, next please. Okay. Hi, I'm Andrew Ku from the uh, uh, a lawyer. Okay. Um. 
If I say anything else, I might get reported wrongly. Um, I'm just going to read you something first and then uh, just tell you a, a, a story from this morning and then ask you to comment about it. Uh, on the 22nd of May uh, last year, the Malaysian Insider published a report uh, with the heading, Judiciary Comes Under Attack for Not Respecting the Rule of Law. And it was a report about a forum that was held the, the night before. And uh, there was a major comment which basically said that uh, Malaysian judges, or most Malaysian judges, fail to recognize that the federal constitution is the supreme law of the land. And this is the reason public law litigation is dead in this country. Uh, a public forum on rule of law and human rights was told last night. Uh, <clears throat> this morning, we had the official ceremony for the opening of the legal year in Malaysia. And the Chief Justice, in his address, uh, referred specifically to this article and basically castigated the Bar Council for not taking action against the lawyer who was quoted uh, in this article by saying that how dare uh, people just vent their frustrations uh, and make comments and criticisms about uh, decisions of the courts in Malaysia uh, without, the, you know, without in some way civility, without... Uh, uh, an understanding of the, the true situation or without uh, decorum and, and things like that. And it actually follows uh, a similar comment that was made yesterday by a Court of Appeal judge, Justice Zahara, in the forum that was linked to the opening of the legal year, where she also talked about the fact that what we have today is a lot of commentators just basically uh, ranting, venting, um, immediately uh, commenting on things that they don't really have uh, any idea about uh, and whether uh, there needed to be controls in some way, checks, balances or controls in order to prevent or restrict or limit uh, these kinds of voices because these were unhelpful to the rule of law, unhelpful to the uh, detrimental to the administration of justice. So my question is, if you have a situation where uh, the people about whom comments are made uh, are saying that, you know, while we appreciate and we don't mind criticism, but, you know, the criticism has to be uh, proper, has to be tempered. A little bit like what Hafiz was, was alluding to just now. I mean, you have to be uh, knowledgeable about what you're talking about. And uh, what we, we cannot have in, in society is just people just reading the headlines and shooting their well, fingers off in this case, right, if you're now uh, tweeting anything, uh, in, in terms of, of uh, comments. And that, you know, if you really want to have a proper uh, uh, political participation of civil society, it has to be A, civil, and secondly, it has to be informed. Uh, your comments, please. Thank you. Um, with one exception for Hafiz, so I'll actually start with your final point, which I don't remember what it was, but I did write down a response. Um, and that was, it was something about what are we all doing toward X, right? But okay, so, and my, my response was that, um, I, my, my sense is that the goal is, and this relates to what uh, YB Sari was just saying, is to promote a concept of active citizenship, that we need to conceptualize the public sphere and politics as being, number one, not sullied, dirty, or illegal, but also as something beyond just electoral politics or just urban NGOs. So um, uh, certainly Zaina touched on this as well in talking about residence associations, the other commentary and talking about groups that are themselves marginalized in different ways also gets at this, this idea that that to promote awareness, to promote critical thinking, to promote self-voice rather than simply turning to patterns of representation can be necessary. In terms of what I do, well, those who can do, those who can't teach, I'm an academic. Um, <laughs> so I probably don't do very much, but I do, um, the, 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 the little bit I do is that I make a point of teaching classes that question various norms. So in other words, I'll f I, I teach <coughs> classes on controversial subjects, make it clear that students can have any view they want so long as they do have some opinion and can defend it, um, and really try to promote uh, an, a, an environment in the classroom of active learning and of engaging with one another within the classroom. That's something that can be done outside a classroom as well, it's just that's the forum I have. Beyond that, in terms of my own research, I get personally frustrated, and this relates to your point, um, as well as um, Hasmi's point. Um, I get very frustrated by the tendency for research, especially in Malaysia, I mean this is a tendency amongst discussions of politics, to focus just on what's happening right now, as though there was no prior era, 
nor are there any other frameworks available, any other perspectives out there. Some of this has to do with media, some of this has to do with just uncritical, um, you know, we, we term it sort of punditry instead of, poli instead of political science, just to take the sort of perhaps snobbish view of my own field. So I do try to make sure that if I'm going to, to research something or write something, I contextualize it historically, comparatively, and otherwise. Um, again, this is not something necessarily difficult. I'm not changing society with anything I'm doing. I, I have no such illusions. But I do think that it's necessary to promote these norms and practices of academic scholarship as well, um, however marginal their impact may be. Um, in terms of your concrete question about violence, we can see this in a couple different ways. Since you bring up the US, I will say that um, part of the issue there is simply that the space for civil society has also opened up a legitimate expect, accepted space that's very difficult to challenge for groups that simply open up access to forms of violence. And I think specifically of groups like the NRA, the National Rifle Association. So part the, the, simple, the simplest explanation for why we have so much violence in all forms of American political and social life is the fact that it is ridiculously, disturbingly, disgustingly easy to get weapons of any form. Um, and so that really has a lot to do with the staunch advocacy of one reading of the Second Amendment of the US uh, Bill of Rights, um, that, um, or of a constitution which um, increases access to firearms. So that's one way of, of thinking about this, is that if we take all citizens' views equally, we may end up with a situation, a policy framework, that's not pleasant to some. A second way, which is the more kind of scholarly way perhaps, would be to think about um, repertoires of activism. So when we talk about repertoires within social movements or protest, we think about the full range of tactical strategies that are available to groups. There's a tendency when we talk about civil society to include only those groups that are civil, that use nonviolent, peaceful, accepted modes of engagement. And yet, we also have groups that appear uncivil, that use violent modes and so forth. What makes this all the more complex is that these are not two completely discrete segments of society. In other words, we have groups that at some times use extremely civil, nonviolent modes and at other times turn to violence. And so the trick here is not to say, are these civil society, are they not, but to ask why or when. All right, so for instance, we have also a, a, quite a lot of discussion um, in the academic literature of groups like Hamas, that it's for, for which their main <coughs> activism has to do with opening schools, providing welfare services, and so forth, but that also in facing or in pursuing other goals turn to more violent means. Does this mean Hamas is not part of a civil society? Okay, it may also turn more towards political society, political parties. But so my own reading as, as someone who works within this, this academic literature is that it, groups may be part of civil society, even if at times they use violent tactics. The trick is to understand why they choose those. Is it because the violence is itself ideologically consistent with the ends they pursue? Or is it because they have no nonviolent means available to them? So in other words, if we want to understand and perhaps to minimize that recourse to violence, we need to understand where it came from. And that's where we can then get into works like Ashutosh Varshney's that Zainab discussed of what sort of circumstances lead groups to turn more readily to violence rather than other modes of conflict resolution or of interest pursuit. Um, and then lastly, um, it, with regard to the, the issues that you raised, um, I'll turn again to um, Zaina's uh, celebration of cacophony and endorse that as well. I mean, I, I fully agree. There's a rhetoric that if civil society lacks unity, then that's a sign of weakness. You find this also directed at certain segments of civil society. If women can't agree on everything, then how is it that the, the polity, the state, can be expected to acknowledge their voices? Why would we ever expect all women to agree on anything? It's, a hu it's just ridiculous. Nor is it a sign of strength in civil society if we don't have cacophony. The sign of a strong, vibrant civil society is that we have a range of voices out there offering a range of different perspectives. And this leads me to uh, Hasmi's question or comment slash question um, about economic slavery and so forth. And I would argue that what's especially useful in trying to combat those patterns of what amount to suppression of different forms is to focus on political and public and individual empowerment rather than simply representation. So in other words, we can have policies that look good, but if they're not those that necessarily emerge from the communities they're designed to serve, if those communities are not aware of them or whatever else, this is still essentially a form of containment, of saying, please, 
you should be disciplined to operate within this framework. And that, that sort of invokes it. the Foucauldian dimension I raised in the talk. I'm drawing that actually from Ed Aspinall's work on Indonesian middle class NGOs, the ways in which they discipline society uh, because they need funds from Western NGOs to follow the precepts, the norms, the preferences, the policy goals of those Western NGOs. Um, and so if we want to promote empowerment, information is part of it. And so both you raised questions of um, access to information and so forth. <coughs> we need space for an awareness of different frameworks for organizing the polity and society. Not just marginal policy changes, not just different ways of conceptualizing who should be dominant at one given point, but rather ways to think about what are the actual goals or objectives of the political system writ large. What would be the framework within those goals should emerge? How should we conceptualize questions of representation and questions of accountability? And that's a really difficult thing to do, right? But that's really what's necessary if we want to make sure that all within society are equally enabled to express their voice and to assert those preferences. And that then brings me to the final point by Andrew Koo, um, this issue of civility and information. There was a recent case that may or may not be familiar to those, those of us here uh, in the US, um, uh, Professor Salaita, who was uh, denied. Do, do people know this case or not? OK, if, if some do. But so he was, uh, just to, to cut it short, he was given a position at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he had put out a number. He was a professor of, of American, uh, Native American studies, American Indian studies. He himself is Palestinian. Uh, he has a, an active Twitter presence and during the Gaza conflict had been quite incendiary with some of those comments. His job offer from the University of Illinois was revoked on the basis of those Twitter comments. And this provoked a debate, prompted a lot, a lot of it by donors to the university, about civility. Um, it prompted a boycott by academics across the country and, and internationally by many of the departments of the university itself against this constraint on academic freedom and voice. This notion that one cannot be objective and neutral and supportive in a classroom if one has strong views. Um, and this debate on what does, it, what does civility mean or require. So by all accounts, and I don't know him personally, Stephen Saleta is an excellent professor, has a civil classroom presence and so forth. And yet, sometimes sharp language is warranted. Sometimes views are tightly held. And sometimes there are not a, lo a lot of other options beyond sharply worded language. So being informed, personally, I think, is necessary and good. And that's why it matters that we have this new array of social media, of online media, an opened media presence in Malaysia, for instance, in terms of opening up the space for critical thinking for discussion. We can't have critical thinking if we don't have information. You, you can think critically about ideas, but then you're not able to ground them in reality on the ground if you don't actually know what's going on, if you only have one side. So there are two separate issues, but they interrelate. We can be civil, but to be civil to engage constructively, we also still need full information. And civility, constructiveness, and so forth does not always mean being polite, not ruffling feathers. Civility means being nonviolent, seeking to engage and listening to others as well who may utter things that don't agree with your ideas either. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, please join us. I thought those were really good responses that Meredith gave. Um, yeah, I know I agree. Um, you know, with 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 um, the com you know comments from the ground about um, you know I, I think the nature of information in today's world, instant information, 24-hour television, 24-hour radio, social media, Twitter. Everybody wants to be the first to share. You know, there's a democratization of information, democratization of knowledge, democratization of authority. So, so, so the way we look at authority today has like totally changed. You can confer, you don't have to be, you, you don't have to have the knowledge to confer yourself the authority to speak out on a particular issue because the medium exists to enable you to create your voice in the public space and to influence you know, people who share your point of view. So this is the challenge um, you know, that we're facing today. And I agree that of course, you know, I mean, you know, in the, the same way like the, that guy who wrote Where Was Isma, like for you to make such a declaratory statement, I would think you would do your research first, you know, and see, in the same way um, Jamehir Barrow, the Minister for Religion, you know, in his response to the G25 letter, on the constitutional and legal, legal limits of Islamic law in Malaysia, 
pronounces there, is, there are no constitutional limits to Islamic law. Like, how, you know, could you, as a cabinet minister in charge of religion, make this statement without first doing your research, you know? So, so we do have a culture, you know, we, you know where people don't read, um, there's no respect for research, for facts, um, you know, it's just a battle of positions, um, you know, and you don't care for truth, you know, so there is this very disturbing culture that has evolved in this country, and everyone has an opinion, you know, but I think we just need to deal with the reality, this is the reality today, so how best do we deal with that reality, so for me, that's why, you know, you can't silence those voices, you know, but then the informed voices, the rational voices that, you know, need to speak out more, you know, and so this is like where I see the significance of the group of 25 as well in speaking out, you know, their criticisms about them, but, you know, to get establishment voices who have never spoken out to speak out is an extremely important contribution to that civil space for rational informed debate. So, so for me then it's, um, you know, it's yes, we, 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 we criticize, um, you know, like if you don't have, in, you know, if you've not done your research, don't open your mouth. And I'm one of those, you know, like I over research every single thing and writing my column is a pain um, because I do too much research and make sure everything is correct to the best of my ability. Um, but, you know, we live in a society where that is not the norm, um, you know, anymore. So I think this is why, you know, then you lose your credibility. You know, you just lose. So then I guess that's a natural weeding out <coughs> then of whose voices have authority in the end, you know. Um, and, 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 and so if you don't like, you know, a particular newspaper, um, then you stop buying the newspaper. So you see the circulation of Utusan and the circulation of NSD just dropping, 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 dropping. You don't like you know, a particular um, online newspaper for its if inflammatory opinion or one-sided views or, you know, there's just too many opinions. But where are the facts, you know, based, the analysis based on facts, you know? So I get very frustrated as well. You know, everyone has an opinion, but it's just emotional venting, you know? So, so, so the Justice Zara does have a point, but I think, I think that's the reality that you have to live with. So then it's really for the more, you know, that, that there should be more voices that are coming out and speaking out, really looking, you know, critically at the issues, supporting your opinions with facts, with data. So those voices are extremely important. And in terms of equal space, you know, I kind of feel that that is unrealistic. So if you give 10 column inches to this point of view, then you must give 10 column inches, you know. So, you know, I don't quite buy that because, you know, every newspaper have their biases, um, um, biases every, every online newspaper. But, you know, they all have a particular point of view. But for me, what is more, so it's okay if they give emphasis to one particular point of view as opposed to other. But for me, what is important is that, that the diverse points of view should be there. You know, or you just then don't read. Like, okay, like, you know, I see myself as a progressive liberal person, so when I was working in London, I buy The Guardian because I know The Guardian represents that liberal voice. I will not buy The Times, you know. Um, so, so, you know, that's the reality you choose. But, you know, you know the, the news, it, is, it is a responsibility of the newspaper to also reflect, you know, the truth on the ground, even if ideologically the owners of the paper or the editorial board of the paper doesn't agree you know so you do have to rep, you know to give a fair representation of the diverse voices and the truth of what's going on um, on the ground even if you don't agree with it and what I find in in our you know media today is that that just doesn't happen and that includes the online media as well very I mean I've spoken to some of my online media friends you know and their reasoning is that, look, the mainstream papers are so biased that we are trying to correct that, you know, that imbalance, you know. So, so also we're expecting, we have these expectations of being balanced. You know, the playing field is not a balanced playing field. So you have the main, mainstream media being very biased, very pro-government. So some of those in the online media feel like the reason why they set up is because, you know, to counteract that very biased mainstream media. And, and that's really, in the end, that's really, you know, where they're at, where they're at. But for me, 
Really, um, you know, I would not want to have censorship. And I think it's really for us, the, the responsible citizens, this, you know, the whole idea of an active, responsible citizenship, people speaking out. And the end is a contestation of ideas. And in the end, you know, as we grow, as we mature, as we really develop a clearer vision um, of where we want this country to go, that those voices need, those voices, I mean, the silent voices really need to begin to speak out, really. Uh, you know, I think too much is at stake in Malaysia today, um, you know, and um, so it's just important for people who really believe, you know, that this country, you know, has to remain multiracial, has to celebrate, continue to celebrate its diversity, its plurality, those voices really need to speak up because we have no other alternative but to learn to live together and to share this nation. Yeah. Small comment uh, in response to Hasbi. Hasbi, eh? Are there? Yeah, you are talking. You are responding directly to my point that I mentioned that the government is not total, but there's some total of uh, conscience of the society, the civil society activism, the state authority, and the harmony. What we are looking, I'm looking into a situation that is called hemostasis. Hemostasis is a dynamic equilibrium of power within a do domain of politics, uh, whether it is in the state authority or in the civil society. Uh, this can happen if uh, we are not talking, if political party is not talking about pemangkang uh, sifa, uh, something like that, talking about uh, grabbing uh, two-third majority. Yeah, we are talking about uh, policy-driven politics, where people are convinced that they would like to uh, vote for one particular political party for the policy, not because of the doctrine, of the brainwashing and so on and so forth. So back to what you mentioned just, just now about Locke. Now, Locke is himself and Rousseau described uh, the civil society uh, as a government, uh, is a civil government as differentiated from all society. So we, if we go back to what is the character of all society, one word described it, feudalism. So you, you get my point. In the slang of context of uh, what, they, what uh, in the issue of Menteri Besar of Selangor, you can see the traces of a strong mentality on feudal thinking of some political party. Surprisingly, uh, the more Islamic it is, <laughs> the more feudal it seems to be. So this is a big challenge and a long way to go because the whole idea of Western society going into civil society is the ability to uh, get rid of feudal mentality within the society. Um, my name is Homa Dar, and I want you to thank everyone for a very excellent, stimulating conversation. Um, my questions will expose my apologies of my ignorance of the particularities of Malaysian context, but I'm hoping that the comparative perspective might be productive. So the first one is, where do, where do the Islamist parties get their funds from? And my uh, comparison is to Pakistan, where before 1979, uh, the year that Iran had its Islamic revolution and uh, Russia invaded Afghanistan, Pakistan uh, never had more than 5% victory for the Islamist parties in any elections until 79. It still has less than 15% ever, um, but it has grown from 5 to 15%. And um, the funds for all the exponential mushrooming growth of madrasas came from USA to create the cannon fodder for the Afghan proxy war, as well as from Saudi Arabia, to bolster the Sunni sentiment to prevent a Shia um, Islamic revolution within Pakistan, where the Shias are at least 25%, perhaps as much as 40% of the population. Um, the second question has to do with class. How does class intersect with communalism in the public sphere uh, of Malaysia. And here, uh, you know, thinking about Ashutosh Varshni, one very significant component that he ignores in his work is that of caste, which although might, be, might seem tangential to Hindu-Muslim strife, but is the, the matrix through which Hindu-Muslim sentiment is actually uh, 
constructed. Uh, so thank you so much, and I will wait for the answers. Hi, uh, my name is Harold Kong. Uh, first thing I want to ask about is the concept of elites and establish, the establishment, the so-called establishment of a country, usually associated with deep interest in the concept of state, even though they may be private actors. Now, in the discourse on civil society, the concept of elites seems to be a reference point that we have but I think we have not put enough attention or focused enough attention on understanding the dynamics within this black box called elites. Is it possible that in a country there can be more than one set of elites? For example, in a large country like the United States, I would have the sense that there may be at least more than one group of elites, however way you want to conceptualize that. That means the group in California may well be different from the group in New York but that's just geographic lines. But there could be other lines of division. So in a civil society, understanding this sector, I think, is important. I'd like to hear some comments. Second point is that, um, you know, in a country where the state or the government does aspire or seemingly, at least on the results they produce, are working hard and producing the results, and that, nobody's saying that they're angels, and I'm not making any statement of normative preference for them, but I pose the question, if civil society were in some way skillfully co-opted by such a system and responds and works perhaps productively, at least for a time, if such a gov government or system, is there anything undesirable um, or illegitimate in some moral sense about this kind of situation? Again, uh, I'd like to have some comments. The third point or question, and questions I'd like to pose is, you know, in the last perhaps 25 years, uh, you know, civil society and concepts of NGO have become far more prominent than at any time in history. To what extent are these organizations accountable to society and what is the mechanism for ensuring that accountability? I think in the answer, funding should figure. I, don't, I, I haven't got the, the, you know, I'd like to hear more about that. Secondly, from the political party standpoint, for example, in Malaysia, I sometimes get a sense that opposition parties try to co-op NGOs. Opposition parties feel compressed by NGOs, as in they're both jostling for space and prominence, and, and they think because they are contesting in the electoral system, they have more legitimacy whenever there's a conflict of viewpoint. To them, their election winning strategies are more important than your concerns. Now, how, how do you grapple with that? I'd like to hear about that. Thanks. Yeah, the last one, please. Hi, um, hi I'm Lucas. Um, is, I'm actually going to ask a relatively short question with regard to you know, the rise of you know, fascist and your fascist groups that um, Dr. Wait. Dr. Weiss has uh, actually uh, taken up because uh, I, I actually noticed like, you know, as I read the news that um, especially, you know, like when you see uh, these uh, left-wing papers, for example, I follow a few uh, left-wing uh, publications and pages and, you know, I think they have a very valid point on, you know, the, the rise of these fascist groups because um, you know, basically the kind of liberalization especially like, you know, when you're talking about social economic liberalization, you know, these people don't always see this uh, so-called liberalization as a good thing. And, you know, what I think their point would, would, that would be that uh, this, li this uh, the rise of such fascist groups like, you know, um, Perkasa and uh, Isma, as well as, you know, uh, foreign fascist groups in Europe and the US, such as, you know, the Pegida movement or even far-right political parties, for example, in places like Western Europe, even Northern Europe. Now, um, perhaps this could be a reaction rather than you know, something that spontaneously happened. Maybe if this is a reaction towards real or perceived over-liberalization of uh, society in, say, Europe because you know, of massive amounts of immigration. And 
aside from that, um, what is the role of the media, the media, uh, you know, uh, the people in power, for example, the rich people, people with a lot of financial resources and connections to media companies? Because I would actually wonder about the role of uh, the media and the very powerful, the very powerful, the very economically powerful people in you know the role of the rise of the these fascist organizations because there there is an article on the Guardian which I've read re regarding this saying that there is a lot of a uh, gap between you know what is actually happening and as well as uh, you know the kind of talking points that they are actually trying to consider. Sorry, the the kind of like typical talking points of these uh, right-wing papers which are usually owned by these uh, billionaire uh, millionaire class people who may or may not be uh, right-wing themselves. What is their role in uh, the rise of fascist organizations and perhaps there is a parallel in between the rise of fascist organizations in Europe and increasingly even the US and perhaps let's say the rise of uh, Pegasa uh, and Isma in Malaysia. That's, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Um, I, I cannot answer where Islamist parties get their money. Um, this question of the intersection of communalism and class in the public sphere, yes, there is an intersection. However, it's not a static intersection. So, you know, there's a history in Malaysia of uh, the coincidence of class with, of, of, of ethnicity with occupational position and so forth. That's changed dramatically. Malaysia is, an, is a 70% urban society now. Um, we do still see this communalization of public life even within class segments um, as well as across them. But it's, it's just to recognize the complexity that's there, but that there may be both class and or communal alignments that play into the public sphere. Um, the, the issue of elites and whether they can be multiple sets, yes, there can and should actually for any possibility of any sort of political or social change must be a range of sets of elites. What matters is not that they just be different individuals or in different geographic positions, but that they represent or, or, or represent, uh, represent or present different ideologies, different programs, different visions of the society they would like to have a role in leading. That's what differentiates those groups of elites. Um, the question of whether it's illegitimate or undesirable for civil societal activists to be co-opted or to work uh, with the state, no. I mean, that's a strategic decision. That gets back to this, this issue of repertoires, uh, strategic repertoires for how one engages. What's necessary, though, is that not all civil society be co-opted by the state, else we lose the purpose of civil society as serving as a check upon that state. We, we lose the possibility of accountability from outside if all choose to work from inside. That's the strategy of co-optation. Uh, so the, this was what the Mexico's uh, Revolutionary Industrial Party, for instance, sought to do, was offer you know, just enough of carrots that more and more of civil society would move within the state, seeing some chance of change. When they failed to achieve that change, civil society had been substantially emasculated in the meantime. So we can think of this in terms of two dominant frameworks for understanding civil society. One is a Gramscian framework in which civil society is an instrument of governmentality. It's how the government inserts itself into the grassroots. The other is a Tocquevillian frame in which civil society supports democracy by offering an independent autonomous check upon the activities of the state. And so it's that latter that tends to perform a more useful function, but these are not mutually, ex but the working within and working without, inside or outside or strategies they're termed, are not mutually exclusive. It's a strategic decision. Lastly, the rise of fascist or neo-fascist groups, I actually tend to recoil against the use of the terms like calling groups fascist or communist or whatever it might be. Those terms, are, groups we don't like, we tend to call fascist. Right-wing groups, we tend to call fascist. Fascism is a, is a specific form of right-wing ideology. And so some of these groups are actually fascist or neo-fascist, but others aren't. And I don't see much use in that gloss. It, it gives rise to conspiracy theories that they're all linked or something else. Um, I don't know to what extent right-wing owned media are complicit in the rise of fascist organizations in Western Europe. The only thing I would assert with some confidence is that we will not find one pattern globally or even across multiple states for the rise of any particular um, critical mass of such organizations. Um, and so there are always root causes that one can trace, often patterns of marginalization lead to, to, to feelings of suppression, of lack of options, and perhaps a, a resistance against the dominant norms of that society. 
but that doesn't necessarily translate into something we might even gloss as fascist. So in other words, we would need to take each of these cases individually and look at the specifics to understand how, when, and why those specific groups have organized and what ends they might achieve. Thank you. Please. Um, I'll leave um, YB Sari to answer the question of funding for <laughs> Islamist party. But I just want to share, you know, I used to be a journalist and I used to cover politics and I used to cover PASS before you were born, maybe. <laughs> uh, you know, so I used to attend the past General Assembly, the Muqtama, every year. And I remember the, year, the first two years of the Iranian Revolution, whenever I covered the Muqtama, the past headquarters filled with pictures of Imam Khomeini. Yeah? Khomeini was the hero. You know, the, the Iranian Revolution, um, you know, mark the success of an Islamic revolution and the rule of the ulama and all that. So everywhere, just pictures of Khomeini everywhere. And I know past leaders were going in and out of Iran and all that. And that was 79, 80, 81, um, maybe. And then suddenly, in the late 80s, past changed its position. Suddenly, Shia, Shia Shiism is un-Islamic. Uh, you know, and, 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 and PAS changed its position together with Pusat Islam, Jakim. Um, you know, both started demonizing Shias. And of course, the natural question that arises is, what happened? Who is behind this demonization process? And I'm sure there's a money trail um, somewhere. You know, to, 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 you know, why did pass, you know, uh, in 1979, 1989, you know, the Iranian revolution measures and the, so the whole rule of the ulama and the rise of Ustaz Hadi and all that came at that period, you know, and the radicalization of pass and all that happened, you know, um, during that period and then it took a different position when it comes to Shia. So I'm sure it's part of the whole you know, um, Saudi, Sunni, you know, geopolitics um, of the Middle East that we, you know, just blindly bought into. It's not our politics, it's not our struggle. It's a struggle of the, of the Middle East between Sunni influence and Shia influence, between Saudi Arabia and its fear of Iranian influence. And therefore, what Huma said, the support of the madrasas, uh, you know, um, at the Pakistan border to build this, create these Taliban's, um, you know. Um, so certainly the U.S. and Saudi Arabia was complicit, were complicit in that. But I just want to comment about the, yeah, the class interaction, I, the, cast, uh, the class um, intersection with communalism in Malaysia. I think, I think part of the reason why we see this desperate attempt to use race and religion in Malaysia by AMNO, by ISMA, by Pakasa is really because the Malays are no longer one homogeneous, poor community. You know, 1969, 75% of the Malays live in the rural areas. The Malays were the dominant, you know. Uh, so, so you could, you know, and, and, and the, the NEP um, is an affirmative action, action program on the basis of race to um, uplift yeah, the Malays to eradicate poverty, to, you know, to end this association of race with occupation. And we now you know, have a differentiated Malay community. We have very rich, elite, upper class Malays, mal huge Malay middle class, and the Malay poor. Um, you know, and, and with different aspirations. We no longer have the same aspirations. There are many Malays in the middle class, in the urban areas, in the professional area, in the professions, who are liberal, who are progressive, who want a review of the new economic policy or even an end to an affirmative action program on the basis of race, because that race is no longer, you know, 70% poor or 80% poor um, anymore. So how can, on the basis, if you continue with the NEP on the basis of race, then rich Malays are benefiting um, as well. Yeah. So, so I think, uh, you know, that one, you know, that this attempt at trying to homogenize the Malay community and Islam, Islam is under threat. The Malays are under threat. Which group of Malays are under threat? Yeah, um, um, and, and, and who really is under threat? Is it UMNO dominance? Or rather trying to think that it's still, you know, dom dom that it wants to be dominant, that is under threat? Or really, you know, is it the Malay? And I feel it is UMNO power that is under threat, 
not the Malays that are under threat. You know, so you want to, as a political strategy, I guess, to, to try and maintain your hegemony over the Malay community, you want the Malays to think as if they're whole one, one whole hegemonic, undifferentiated community. You know, and I think the challenge now for Amno is really because the Malays have very different aspirations. Yeah, the rich, the poor, the Islamists, um, the liberals, the progressives, you know, and, 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 and the politics on the ground, the realities on the ground have changed, um, but Amno doesn't know how to deal with it, with this, and it only knows its same old bag of tricks, you know, race and religion, and it doesn't work anymore. Um, in terms of civil society working with government, yeah, I mean, you know, it, actually we do have um, people <laughs> here who can talk and about government um, opposition parties co-opting, um, you know, NGOs. Um, yeah, I mean, as a civil society group, I mean, Sisters in Islam, it's, it's a debate that we have sometimes. Should we be engaging with the government or not? You know, and sometimes depending on the period. So it has to be strategic. Um, I remember once, um, you know, when we supported the government's um, policy announcement that, you know, the, in, uh, I don't know how much time, okay, quickly. Guardianship of children comes, falls under Islamic family law for Muslims. The government amended the Guardianship of Children's Act to allow non-Muslim mothers the equal right to guardianship of children upon divorce. Equality for non-Muslim women, but for Muslim women, no. We come under Islam, therefore you cannot have equal rights. <laughs> you know? So are we supposed to you know, just lie down and let this roll over us? So of course, sisters in Islam protested and we lobbied the government. You know, but to amend the Islamic family law that grants only fathers the right to guardianship of children, we know how difficult it is. You've got to like lobby 13 different, 14 different jurisdictions. So we push for a policy reform. You know, asking the government then to amend to procedure all those forms, those government's forms that require the signature of the guardian, which under Islamic family law means the father, we say change it to father, mother, or guardian. So that, you know, registration of schools, parents divorce, you need the signature of the father. The father has disappeared from the child's life. Passports, children want to go overseas to study. But you need the father's signature, he's disappeared. And children can't study overseas because the father has disappeared and the, ch the child can't get a passport. These are real problems. We lobbied the, the cabinet then to change, okay, can't change the law? change the form so that mothers can sign. You know, surgery, emergency surgery. Kid is dying and needs emergency surgery. You can't find the father to sign. And are you supposed to allow this kid to die? You know, because you can't get, find the father to sign but, um, the, 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 the author, authorization form. So we had compelling evidence on the ground. And so we lobbied the government to say, change um, um, these forms, yeah? So that Muslim women can equally benefit from the law reform that has benefited non-Muslim um, mothers. And we were criticized by some groups, why do you work with the government? So when the government changed the, made the policy announcement, we of course, you know, some of us in civil society welcomed it. Um, you know, but there were others who said, no, you should not welcome anything that the government does because again, the point that I think Meredith made in the paper that that's we seen as you are giving um, strength and power to an oppressive government. You know, but I think we just need to be strategic, re realistically, and I made the point, well, PAS comes into power, you think PAS is going to recognize the mother's right to equal guardianship, you know, that's not an alternative, it's not going to happen, you know, maybe now it will happen. <laughs> because I do recognize that PAS is changing and evolving, or there are people in PAS who are changing and evolving and getting real. Um, you know, so, so these are strategic questions in which um, you need to make those decisions, but I think it's extremely important, I agree with what Meredith said, you know, that you can't have too many, you know, NGOs being co-opted, joining opposition politics, <laughs> you know, um, and, and be a part of the partisan party politics, you know, so I think it's important that there are civil society organizations um, that remain independent and will take positions whether to support or not to support based on principles, based on policies, you know, based on, you know, really be truly guided by what is it that it stands for and not because this is the government so I'll be opposed or this is the government therefore I will support, right or wrong, you know, this is the opposition I will support or I, you know, so it really has to remain guided 
you know, by principles, you know, and be vigilant, you know, because we act as a check and balance on the power, you know, of governments, you know, and now that the opposition parties are in state authority, you know, in several states, you know, civil society need to play, continue to play that role of check and balances um, on the powers of, of, of political parties. Why well, interested about the funding of the party? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Zainal said, uh, past was very busy in Kastabia uh, eh? with uh, pictures of Ayatollah Khomeini. I was demonstrating in uh, Hyde Park, London, in support of the Iranian Revolution in 1979. <laughs> uh, I did my engineering uh, course there with my family, my wife, and our kid. Uh, we were a strong spirit of supporting the revolution, but not the, what happened in the uh, picture and so on. So, okay, in my case, yeah, uh, I, I, I can relate to you. Yeah, Guli is, uh, is also can share how the funding of the party. You are interested only in Islamist party. Yeah. Uh, in, and you? She was asking about Islamist party. Yeah, Islamist party. So, in my case, I uh, stood for election four times. Uh, 99, 2004, 2008, 2013. Two times under Parti Keadilan Nasional, Parti Keadilan Rakyat, and two times under PAS. Two times uh, under PKR and PK, PKN uh, was in parliamentary seat, uh, in Dari Kuala Langat and uh, Paya, Paya Besar, Kuantan. Uh, then uh, the two times in Ulu Kelang, Don. So, uh, most, in most cases, in all the cases, four times, we have, as candidate, we look for our own fund friends, uh, from NGO, from the party, but at the front level, at the front level. So I do not know other than that. So this is my experience. Tegoli, you, you want to share? Um, some uh, companies and corporations do not. Wow. That's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I make sure I do not get, get contribution from company. I uh, only personal friend, in my case, four times. That's it. Okay, thank you very much uh, to all the panelists and to Professor Mary Wise for being with us today. And thank you to all of you for being here.